Okay, so uh, welcome to the second uh, winter webinar series. Um, this is just a follow on from last week and we're going to delve into a little bit more detail just about some routes to market and pricing. Um, so just uh, apologies from Karen, she has an appointment to attend to today, but I've got Mary and Louise with me here today um, to keep me company going through the presentation. So um, as we said, feel free to pop any questions into the chat box um, and we can review at the end of it. So my name is Lisa Johnston. If you're on the webinar for the first time and perhaps missed last week, I am one of the Fermanagh and Oma District Council Tourism Mentors and I've been working with a few of you over probably the last couple of years um, on different areas of your business and uh, delighted to meet more of you as time goes on here. Um, just the housekeeping rules. Uh, Indeed, mute your, your audio during the presentation. Uh, use the chat box, as we've said, and then uh, just to make you aware again, then the webinar will be recorded for future reference. So we will share this for anybody that wasn't able to attend today. So the purpose of the webinar this morning um, is all about creating these demand generating experiences. So experience development is, you know, a kind of a hot topic in tourism in Northern Ireland. And we want to make sure that we kind of give you as much support as we possibly can in terms of excuse me, <clears throat> enhancing the, the visitor experience and supporting you on your journey, whether you're just at the very, very start of your tourism business or indeed if you're a more mature tourism business, there should be something in this webinar for everybody. So today's session, as we've said, we'll look through in a little bit more detail about those routes to market and you know, coming into tourism as I did for the first time about four or five years ago, it is quite a complex system, a kind of complex ecosystem. So um, what we're going to try and do is demystify some of that for you today. Um, we'll also look at pricing and this is again another big topic. So if you don't have your pricing right, you're not going to make any profit. If you don't make any profit, you know, it's it's sometimes not worth your while being involved. Um, so again, trying to demystify some of the terms and terminology around that and try and give you a simple mechanism to kind of, uh, in the first instance, working out profit for your experiences. So all in all, these, these mechanisms are all here to support you. Um, you know, uh, you've, you've got obviously Karen, Louise is going to come in and, and share what she does in Lakelands Tourism. And then there's a, a you know, a panel of mentors uh, that the council look, look uh, after as well that, that are there to support your needs. Okay, so the first topic then is the Ritz to Market. Um, so this slide is just kind of illustrating what we call the sales channel um, and it's almost like a funnel if you think about it in that way uh, in terms of your considerations. So it is a diverse sales channel and there's different elements to that. So we have, as you can see there, there's the direct route um, to selling your product or your experience and there's an indirect route to selling your product and experience and we'll expand on that in a little bit more. So once you've decided which sales channel you're going to, to use, and you can use multiple sales channels, um, you then need to have a bit of a decision in terms of what market you're, you're targeting. So there's a number of different markets. Probably the entry market for all of us in tourism is the domestic market. So that's our local market here within Northern Ireland, but also stretching out to our closer to home markets. So we would uh, describe them as being the GB market and then the All Ireland or ROI market. Um, so they're the, the, the markets that are closer to us to attract and um, to take part in our experiences. The other markets then we have, we kind of just bundle them together in terms of international and that's everywhere else in the world. Um, and there's a different kind of methodology and me mechanic in terms of dealing with international uh, uh, visitors. And again, these can be either through the direct channel or the indirect channel. So just bringing that down another level then, if we look at the domestic market, we then further categorize our customer segments. So Tourism and I, uh, uh, Tourism Ireland, uh, have done an awful lot of work in kind of defining these personas that would enjoy your experiences. And this is so helpful for you. So you can actually pop on to the um, domestic uh, NI strategy that's located on the Tourism Hub uh, provided by Tourism NI and you can get a really good breakdown of what each of these customer segments uh, aspirations, needs, desires are and even as much as what their average budget that they would spend. So in Northern Ireland here currently we have three customer segments that are our priority segments and they are our aspiring families, our comfort seekers and our natural quality seekers. So they're kind of the, the, the focus uh, of all of our attention. 
We also have another group called the Social Instagrammers, which tend to be a little bit younger. And again, they have uh, different things that they're looking for in terms of experiences. And Tourism and I have been very, very savvy in terms of how they communicate with these uh, customer segments, because they will tailor it depending on where that customer lives on social media. So you can imagine the social Instagrammers, there's a lot of activity on Instagram and TikTok and the like, whereas maybe the likes of the Aspiring families have been more focused around uh, TV advertisements um, and indeed Facebook as well. So that's trying to give you, uh, I suppose, the journey in terms of your decision making process whenever you're deciding who you sell to and how you sell to them. So just to again delve down a little bit more, we've talked about direct. So what is direct? We tend to think of direct as uh, people that will come to you uh, that are independent travellers that are free to choose where they want to go. They'll do a little bit of researching themselves. They'll be both offline and online. Uh, they'll primarily find you through your website or social media, but also, you know, they'll, they'll call you, uh, they'll walk onto your premises. And these are people that you have direct contact and communication with. These are the people that you can build really strong relationships with and actually upsell uh, what you're about to them directly. The other one then that we talked about on the previous slide was indirect. So this is uh, an opportunity for you to sell your product uh, through another third party. Um, and we call them uh, either inbound tour operators or destination management companies. And there's a plethora of other descriptions in terms of how you can, how you can interact with the indirect market. But the main ones are uh, the ITO, uh, ITO and the destination management companies, the DMCs or the DMOs. Um, and you'll find these people at trade shows. Uh, you'll find them um, uh, a lot of the time, maybe they'll contact you. They'll maybe operate a kind of group series that they'll come and visit. But this will be an ongoing relationship that you will have to establish with them. And it takes an awful long time to gain that trust. So you might start engaging at a trade show with a particular operator. And it might be 18 months before you actually see the fruits uh, of, of what you've uh, of what you've been trying to do because uh, it does take a long time to build a relationship and they plan so far ahead uh, and you always need to bear that in mind. So if you're coming to this fresh as a kind of a new tourism product, definitely think about direct as your main opportunity and eventually you will grow into that kind of indirect relationship. And again, all of this information, loads of information on the TNI portal. So I would encourage you to go bounce onto that and have a little bit of a look through in terms of how they describe the routes to market. So again, a little bit more explanation about direct channels. And for me, this is kind of trying to understand, you know, who they are, why they would come to you, how they would come to you. And we call these uh, B to C communications. So this is where you as a business are actually talking directly to your consumer. And again, this massive opportunity to, for you to build relationships, to upsell your product um, and, and everything that you're about. And this is really where we start to sell the embrace a giant spirit personality of what we have here in Northern Ireland. So as you can see, kind of going around on that little chart there, um, it can be walk-ins as we've talked about in phone inquiries. They will engage with your website. So really, really important if you feel that your website isn't exactly where it needs to be in terms of the communication on it, reach out and ask for help. Um, either to myself or to Karen or to Mary or to anybody that you know kind of within uh, uh, that network and that support network and see how you can upgrade your website to make sure that people aren't coming on to it and bouncing off on it and not finding what they need. Social media are really, really crucial. Um, that's a whole topic that you probably spend a day talking about and there's so many different elements to it. Uh, my advice always with social media is is operate social media where you feel comfortable, you know, and that will help you attract the, the, the clients that uh, are a good fit for your business. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do that. You know, you can write blogs and vlogs, you can record podcasts, obviously Facebook, Instagram, like there's so many different things that you can do. Um, but really try and convey the personality of what you're about and show beautiful imagery of, of your location, of people enjoying the experience. And again, there's lots of support around content creation um, that we can help you with if you feel that that is a gap within your current business model. Personal referrals and reviews are so important and crucial as well. So always make sure that if you're getting those good reviews, you know, share them loud and proud on your social media channels and your website. And um, because without a doubt, you know, a huge pro percentage of your uh, return customer will come from these personal referrals. And I suppose a really good point to make as well is this is the lowest cost way to drive your business. 
because you're not having to go to any massive expense doing marketing campaigns um, or, or getting involved in uh, anything that's uh, budget heavy. Uh, but if you can get those personal referrals and it's all about communication, it's the follow up after the visit, making sure that people enjoy themselves and just that personal interaction really makes a massive amount of difference. And it is the lowest cost thing you can do to retain and grow your customer base. And obviously working together, like we talk about this all the time, collaboration is so important in our industry um, and it's such a collaborative industry as well. We're all there to help one another. We're all there to support one another and cross promoting businesses is so important. And uh, there's lots of different examples of success of how we've done this well, even in uh, your own business district in terms of partnering together. Um, to really enhance what that experience is. And don't be afraid to go out there and kind of ask the questions to somebody who you think will be a good fit for your business. And also, if somebody comes and asks you knocking on your door and you don't feel it that's if they're a fit for your business, again, don't be afraid to say, look, it's not for me right now. I'm going in a different direction. And don't be kind of feeling as if you're, you're forced into doing something you don't want to do. But it's really important to find those partners um, that can enhance what you're doing and you're enhancing what they're doing because we're all stronger together. So just back to the customer then, uh, and I suppose this is, is, is just something that we need to really think about in quite a bit of detail. And working with the tourism industry over the last little while, this has definitely been a gap that I have seen, is that uh, it's very, and it is a big task to kind of build that customer profile and understand who it is that's coming to your premises and enjoying the offer that you have. But it's really important information to try and build. You need to have an accurate, detailed customer profile. Uh, and keep records. And this will help you in every dimension of your business. It will help you to tweak your experience to better suit the needs of your client. It will also help you with funding applications whenever they ask you who you're targeting, what is the split of your business? Are you primarily domestic? Do you want to grow internationally? You know, do you need to, to look at your website in terms of uh, what might be needed for language translation? So really important to set up some sort of system. In the first instance, it might just be a spreadsheet or a book um, to capture who those people are. So you want to be able to capture certain information. You want to be able to know how to contact them to be able to send out further uh, information. Of course, make sure your GDPR policy is in place to be able to do that. Um, your social media channels that they engage with. So how did they find you? That's a fair question to ask. Where have they come from? What channel have they booked through? And um, what have they liked or disliked about their stay or their experience with you? Um, and the purpose of their visit, whether it's maybe been a corporate visit or a leisure visit or something like that. But this, this information, as much information that you can gather is so, so uh, rich and important in terms of how you develop your business going forward. So that valuable customer base will allow you to go back to reconnect with past customers, give them up-to-date information on what future promotions or activity that you might have, and give them reasons to revisit uh, mark an anniversary or a special family occasion. So even now coming up to Christmas, like likes gift vouchers and things, if you have a really solid database, email database of people you can uh, uh, contact, you could be sending out you know, the offer around gift vouchers to be spent throughout the year. So really crucial that you think about how you build that uh, database of customers. Moving on a little bit more into direct uh, channels. So again, these can be business to business and they can also be business to consumer. And I'm just going to highlight two here uh, just to keep things simple for today. So we've got online uh, travel agents, which essentially are the guys that we kind of see out there, uh, the likes of the Expedias, uh, the booking.coms of this world, uh, where the customer will go on and just kind of book directly with them. So they are an opportunity for you to sell to a wider audience, but there's certain criteria that will come with that. And there's certain considerations that will follow on later on in the presentation in terms of how much commissions and things that they will take for actually promoting your product. So the good thing about them is they don't demand so much of your time in terms of resource, in terms of interaction to get the conversion of the sale. However, they will then obviously require some sort of commission uh, towards doing that on your behalf. So the other ones that I would describe then, I would call traditional, probably just because they're kind of born out of the traditional way that tourism has developed over you know, the decades. And these are the destination management companies, the tour operators or the travel agents. And we have lots of them that are very interested in Northern Ireland. Uh, you'll, you'll come across them at trade events, uh, meet the buyer events. And we thought this is a really good opportunity then to introduce Louise, who is from Manor Lakelands. So Louise, 
I will pass over to you if you want to uh, kind of do your meet and greet with the group. Yes, hello everybody. Um, luckily enough, Lisa, everybody knows me and probably knows enough about Fran Lake Land Tourism. Um, there was supposed to be a couple of people that were non-members um, going to be on here, so I guess it was kind of a plug for them. But just to reiterate, I guess, what Fran Lake Land Tourism does. If you can pop the next slide on for me, please, Lisa. Yep, so obviously, um, as you guys know, at least you may not be as familiar with it, but we're a membership-based organisation. So um, although we're part funded by Fermanagh and Oma District Council, we rely pretty heavily on the contribution of the local tourism trade. So members pay us an annual membership fee and we use those fees and um, basically put them in a pot and that's our marketing fund. So our priority is obviously to showcase the area and um, encourage visitors um, domestic, uh, ROI and international and we believe that membership will help um, businesses you know, provide visibility for them, grow these indirect channels as you're talking about there and help build a relationship um, moving forward with other businesses and um, get obviously visitors and bookings. Um, there's a number of benefits to becoming a member of Man Lake Land Tourism, uh, the main one of which is a product listing on our website for manalakelands.com. So just recently, actually in mid-October, um, we launched a brand new website. Um, it is so much more user-friendly, so much more visual, um, much more engaging. And um, actually the web development company that we used, we are using them to do um, some search engine optimization for us as well. So that's working pretty well for us so far. And we've actually seen um, the page views and all increase just over the last month and a half. So we're hoping that will um, continue to grow. Um, obviously, there's a number of other membership benefits, access to our social media channels, profile and printed materials, inclusion in um, marketing campaigns, press and influencer visits. Um, we would include our members in our presentations. And I highlighted that at the at the last webinar, you know, a number of the trade events we've been to recently, like the ITOA workshop, Meet the Buyer, um, these experience um, experiences really catch attention of the tour operators and they're really um, interested. And I think, you know, COVID has definitely helped from Anna Lakelands um, stand out in their mind because a lot of their clients is coming to them saying they want these rural destinations, they want to avoid the built up busy areas and then when we have this wealth of product and experiences there for them um, it's really catching their attention so I think if we can can grow those and make those more um, seller friendly um, they're, they're really working to our benefit and obviously then there's opportunities then to attend trade shows and consumer events. For example, we're, well, we were supposed to attend Dublin Holiday World now in January. Um, it's been delayed until March, but that's another opportunity um, as well as others, but they're just the main highlights of becoming a member. So if we just flick on to the next slide, it just shows then a couple of examples. How many members do you have, Louise, currently then? Um, just over 220. Wow. So throughout all the sectors, so obviously accommodation, activities, attractions, the cruising sector, this is just a small sample of the kind of things we've done um, this year. Um, our summer campaign, um, we were lucky enough, we had a um, budget, we got some funding from TNI, we were able to do some TV advertising. We did a TV ad on RTE and UTV, and we do um, quite a bit of digital advertising, so you can see some of our social creatives there along the bottom. So. Again, it's just to help these businesses, you know, build their profile and um, help, you know, bring their product to the market. Yeah, and, and one thing came up, Louise, the last time with Karen, and it's really worthwhile because you're so close to it. Mm -hmm. Whenever we talk about kind of the macro uh, level in terms of the customer segments, the aspiring families and the comfort seekers and all the rest of it, how does that how does that fit in with uh, what you're do you see the the audience being for from Anna Lakelands and Oma uh, as well? Is is yeah. that kind of fair representation of who's interested in the area, or would you see one stronger than the other? Well, um, we would basically, like we would, um, our like campaigns are all, um, you know, segmented into those target markets. So like our digital campaign, we would really concentrate on expiring families and um, natural quality seekers. Um, the ROI have recently introduced a new um, target segment, indulgent relaxers. Um, and actually, we just had a report on our social media and um, digital advertising, and we were surprised at we had targeted social Instagrammers, but it wasn't, we thought, a strong market for us, but we actually had quite a lot of engagement. Mm -hmm. 
okay. from that market and it's something that we're um, into the spring we're going to take a little more of a look at it which um, you know traditionally it would have been seen more as the cities and for a target mark for them to concentrate on so it was quite interesting for us we were actually surprised by the stats that we got back on that yeah, I suppose it just reiterates the importance of all that good information that you can get to help you make the right decisions in terms of who you're marketing to. Yeah, and before, you know, traditionally we are like your digital advertising, we could have would, would have went a lot geographical locations, whereas now you can concentrate more on the interests and all that's pulled in from those um, segments. So I think that definitely works better and you get a better selection of people throughout. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now we move on to pricing, uh, which can, I suppose, sometimes feel like quite a dull conversation. But uh, as I say, hopefully going to bring some uh, kind of uh, tools to you today to help you see uh, how you can bring it to your own uh, business. So just looking at pricing pitfalls. So again, I mean, these are obvious things, but these are probably the top things that I would see whenever I'm uh, working with the tourism sector. So I think first and foremost for me is assuming that everybody wants to pay the lowest price. We all get caught in this trap. You know, we're, we're, we kind of pull together experiences. We put so much time, effort and our own resource into it. And then, you know, it's so easy to try and just then undersell it almost in order to get the ticket sales. Um, so not everybody does want to, want to pay the lowest price and we need to bear that in mind and perhaps as well if you turn it on its head if we're leading with the price as the first communication we're probably not doing ourselves uh, the justice that we should that we deserve because it should be about the added value that you're giving to the customer that's visiting it should be the upsell of you know all our credentials around embrace a giant spirit the uniqueness of the surroundings the uniqueness of the people the food uh, the landscape you know the opportunity that you have to to engage with us you know uh, is something very unique and and we're so authentic in terms of our approach and how we do this so yeah make sure you don't always just opt for the lowest price in order to get the ticket sales uh, and assume people want to pay the lowest price because um <clears throat> sometimes a slightly higher price um, can add that kind of quality factor to what you're offering so the other thing is then uh, it's very easy for us to kind of add our own views about money and pricing to our products and that can represent what we feel we're worth you know so if we're looking at you know how much would i pay for this if i was going to market might lead us to the conclusion that we'll actually again undervalue what we're worth and um, so make sure that you kind of try and take the emotion out of it and look at it more objectively in terms of how you're setting your pricing and um, in terms of what people are getting and even it's a very simple exercise you know to sit down and just bullet point each of the different elements that the, 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 the visitors are going to be involved in and just put you know a nominal figure to that will help you see and help you build what that really should be worth and um, so again just try to take your own kind of blinkered view in terms of what you would pay for it um, uh, especially whenever we're taking these products to the international market because as I say you know everything that we stand for here in, in Northern Ireland is so unique and authentic uh, and we have to make sure that we represent that in, in the value that we're getting in terms of price and then the last one is um, you know not to focus on necessarily quantity and I suppose that's kind of leading on from the first point there as well uh, we want to develop experiences that are at the highest quality um, and it's you know it's quality versus quantity uh, we, we, we've all seen uh, kind of the, the dilemmas around over tourism and, and pe people flocking to places. And as Louise has said, that's actually not what visitors want anymore. They want off the beaten track. They want uncrowded places. Um, and we all have kind of a, I suppose, a, a, a moral a moral uh, ethos around the, the, res the responsible and sustainable tourism uh, uh, option on our businesses as well. So we need to bear that in mind. So again, uh, you know, it's not necessarily about quantity, about getting ticket sales, about getting bums on seats. Uh, we want we want to have uh, high quality products to market as well. So this is uh, a little again, as you'll if you've come to my workshops before, you probably know I like to do things quite visually because it helps me to understand them. So hopefully sharing that with you. So this is what I call the experience development workflow. Um, that really takes you through a number of different stages whenever you're doing your experience development. Um, so as you can see there, it's identifying the market need, looking at the experience concept. Then once you've done that, it's that roadmap to bring in the experience to life. Then looking at your minimal viable experience to market. So that's the very minimum that you could take to market. 
then looking at the minimal market experience and then the why factor. And that's kind of a series that you would work through. And it could take you six months to a year, really, to get to the end of that journey. But what I really wanted to point out here is that in each of these different kind of mechanisms as we work through them, pricing comes up an awful lot. You know, it's always looking at, uh, you know, what you can add value with, making sure that you're making money um, and monetizing that and actually making it a commercial success that's viable for the future. Um, so as you can see, pricing kind of flows through the whole experience development workflow. Um, and as I said at the bottom here, I always reiterate to everybody, you know, you need to make that assessment of your resources, the time, both uh, the time yourself, the human resource and the financial resource whenever you're working through those workflows. So just if you didn't realise it before, pricing is kind of crucial to experience development. So how do I price my products? What steps do I need to think about whenever I'm going to take my product to market and work out how much somebody's going to pay for it and make sure that I am actually making a profit? So first and foremost, obviously decide what products and experiences you want to bring to market. And at that stage, you know, you're working through that workflow. Um, you've assessed the market need, you know, that there's an appetite for people to come and enjoy what you have to offer. Um, and then you're starting to think about, you know, what are the what are the costs? And we talk about fixed costs and variable costs. So we're gonna, gonna go into a wee bit more detail about them and what they mean. Um, so you have to have a firm understanding of them. Um, and then also then think about what the minimum and maximum numbers are to run an experience. So quite often, again, uh, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap where you're maybe running an experience for two people, you know, try and try and think about what is the minimum number of people to make this worth my while. And it might be 10, it might be four, it might be 20, um, but you need to make sure that you have a good understanding of what that minimum number is uh, in order to make it worth your while. Uh, and, and the tourism industry appreciate that as well. You know, they, they, they don't want you kind of running experiences that uh, aren't are good for you either. So then the next kind of decision you need to make uh, is whether or not you're going to use the indirect sales channels because they will obviously affect your pricing model as well. Um, so in the first instance, as was said here, you know, probably best to look at domestic, but always whenever you're setting out your pricing for your products, have that consideration, try and have a little bit of foresight in terms of down the line, if I want to attract the international market, where do I need to price my product to make it attractive to them and making sure that you know, we're not undervaluing what we're doing in the domestic market uh, by selling it at a price ceiling uh, for the market here, which then has an adverse effect on whenever we go to sell to direct the indirect market. And then finally, know your break even or know your profit. So really important um, to understand all of those things. And again, having experienced this with some of you uh, through through the last few months and, and a year or whatever, um, whenever you come to do any funding applications, this is the type of stuff that they want to know. They want to know, are you making money in terms of what you're doing? Do you have a viable business? Um, and is it sustainable for the future? So, so important to, to have these kind of pricing thoughts and discussions within your own business. <clears throat> One other thing that's very important whenever we look at pricing as well is to benchmark similar experiences. So this isn't necessarily kind of looking at a competitor and just doing what they're doing. This is about having a more holistic view of what else is out there, not only in your own market, but further afield. So it's just a simple Google search, you know, get on, have a look at what other people are doing. I've just thrown up one here, which is the Burn Farm experience um, and see what they're offering, what uh, what the kind of the, the value, the duration, you know, what, what is the, the stipulation to write tour groups and different things, just to give you a feel for what else is out there in the market. So as I say, it's not copying uh, what other people are doing, but it's just having a feel for what else is out there. Okay. Another one I've just thrown in here that I've come across quite recently, actually, uh, which I would advise you all to go and have a look at, is uh, this kind of foraging and bully experience. Now, I've never come across bully before, but it's actually uh, a, a method of making butter, I believe. Um, so this gentleman uh, is down in the Mourne Mountains. It's Mourne Ways, Ireland. And he has really crafted some lovely experiences that are all about intangible culture um, and actually giving people the opportunity to participate in traditional methods uh, that, you know, if he didn't kind of uh, yeah, have them to market, they may possibly have died out. Uh, but it's getting out within the flora and fauna, doing a bit of hiking um, and understanding what that log forgotten mountain bully is all about. So um, I, would, I would stress to go and check out Brian and what he's doing there, because it's a really lovely experience just whenever you're kind of looking at benchmarking and uh, new things that have come to market kind of within 2021. 
This is going to be a video, so again, on the benchmarking uh, conversation. So I thought this one would be quite interesting. This is the Sunrise Sup and Island Yoga Experience. So they are an experience uh, which has been brand aligned. And we talked about this a little bit in the last workshop. So that means that they've gone through a process with Tourism NI and they meet all of the requirements and credentials uh, to be aligned with the Embrace a Giant Spirit brand, which allows them to be part of the Giant Spirit uh, collection, which you will see being sold on Discover Northern Ireland. So this is the kind of the, they've been on a journey over the last number of, of months and, and definitely uh, 12 at least um, to get their experience where it is. So it's bringing together uh, yoga and also uh, sup as well. So we'll just have a little watch of this video and have a look at some of their content then as well. Meet Rory. He's designed the whole experience to put you in touch with nature. You'll get to feel all the physical and mental benefits of exercise and yoga in the outdoors in a truly unique part of the world. Rory will guide you on a paddleboard tour to a remote island. Never paddleboarded before? No problem. The basics are covered in each class. Stand-up paddleboarding? It's like a form of slow adventure. So it's the perfect way to switch off from the stresses and strains of everyday life. Paddleboarding's a great way to get fit too, according to Rory, and it helps with balance and agility. When you get to the island, Jen will lead you in a yoga flow. This is where you get to maximize your connection with the outdoors. Afterwards, you'll have a light breakfast of locally sourced food on the island before paddling back to shore. Strangford Lock is an amazing place and paddleboarding is a great way to see it. There's at least 75 Drumlin Islands, monastic sites, lightships, and even ruined castles. You may be lucky enough to spot oyster catchers, cormorants. There's over 2,000 species of bird life. And if you're lucky, you may see a seal. Just being in nature and getting to do these things in fresh air, all your senses are awakened. Even just going between the land and then going onto the sea, it's just a whole body experience. As soon as you close your eyes and you can hear the birds and feel the air and the sun on your skin, it's just way better than doing it in a room inside somewhere. The Strangford Lock Activity Centre's Sunrise Stand Up Paddleboard and Island Yoga Experience. We promise you an experience you'll never forget. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed that, that video. And really, for me, that's just an example of, you know, whenever you're looking at pricing, it's actually, you know, don't sell on price. These guys are obviously selling on the uniqueness of what they offer. Um, and that's really important as well. Uh, okay. Next. Oh, there we go. We're back on. Okay, so whenever we, we, we're considering pricing for our experiences, there will be, I suppose, uh, some sort of segmentation around our experiences and what, what we offer. So you can have what we call a portfolio of experiences, um, which will target different markets uh, and different market segments, customer segments. So you can have a core experience, which might have slightly less profit margin, be a shorter duration, um, but something that you run maybe more often. And that core experience might be really nicely suitable for your domestic market. And you may only ever sell that experience to the domestic market because it's priced for the market and it's offering uh, the, the particular customer segment what they need out of the experience or what they desire out of the experience. But then you might consider, well, how do I enhance that experience? That's my core experience, but actually I want to enhance it and be able to offer that to maybe an international visitor that's traveling uh, over on their holidays. And for them, perhaps price isn't the first consideration at all. They just want to make sure that they have the holiday of a lifetime whenever they come to visit us. Um, so these would be in premium experiences. So they should be slightly higher margin because there's a little bit more effort on your side that needs to go into it. And um, they can be half day or full day, but these are really kind of those unique why factor experiences that are not easily replicated. Um, so you can have a mix within your, your experience portfolio and I actually would encourage you to have that mix uh, within your experience portfolio. So to give you an example of how that might work, one of the providers that I work with had a, a canoeing experience that you know was just kind of traveling around different islands around Strangford Lock. And whenever you came off, um, you had refreshments, which would probably just be a flask of hot tea and, you know, some nice barn brack at the side of at the side of the lock. But he was able to elevate that to a premium experience by actually taking the canoes out and then stopping on a secret island. 
and the whole story around the island. But then whenever they stopped on the secret island, he would actually have foraged for mussels and then cook them off on the island with some Dunville's whiskey. So you can see how you have a core experience that might have a, a wider appeal with a slightly more lower margin, but then you can enhance that experience to make it a premium offering that will suit uh, a different market segment. So just try and think about uh, how you how you kind of uh, develop that experience portfolio whenever you're thinking about pricing your market for different segments. Uh, another provider that I've had the, the pleasure of working with is Jamesy. You probably all know him well. I know some of you might have been up to see him uh, recently. Um, but Jamesy, uh, you know, fairly new to the tourism industry, only the last couple of years. I think definitely 2019, whenever he was launched at World Travel Market, was probably his kind of launch into the into the industry. And Jamesy did this very, very, very well. So he had got his core kind of experiences that he would take to market. Um, for his international market and it has to be said whenever GMC started his journey it was very much just for the international market um, and he was able to as I said kind of just have that bullet point description of what what made up that experience what different elements was the, the visitor able to engage with what were they going to get out of that experience um, and then that allowed him to be able to kind of work on the minimum maximum numbers which we talked about what was the duration and then work out his price per head and then also thinking about what are those inclusions, what are those add-on extras that are maybe going to be a, what we call a variable cost uh, that needed to be add on, added on as well. And then taking that up a step further, moving away from the sheepdogs and the sh uh, sheepdogs at work, which was literally just Jamesy kind of instructing the, the, the dogs to kind of round up the sheep and do all, all sorts of things at his command. Um, and then how would he elevate that? So he brought together that experience along with the sharing aspect of what he does. So he he shares by hand, I think you even have an opportunity to do it for yourself. Um, and then he talks about the whole concept of the kind of the fleece to fashion and goes back into the history about, you know, our textile industry, about how the, the wool is shared, it's cleaned and how it's carded and made into wool. Um, and you get an opportunity to kind of use a traditional spinning wheel. So that's a much more premium uh, experience. It's obviously going to command a much higher uh, retail price. Uh, but it's, it's, it's unique and it's probably difficult to replicate because he's the only person that does it in his particular style um, and bringing all these things together. And you can see there at the bottom, you know, bringing in the local food element of it, which is so important, which again will elevate the value of your proposition. Um, so all those kind of things to think about. So again, back to kind of def designing that portfolio of experiences uh, is, is really crucial uh, in terms of how you pitch your pricing to your different markets. Okay, so trying to, to break all of this down um, in terms of how you work out what your profit is. Um, so we've talked a little bit here about fixed costs and variable costs, and it's kind of for you to understand the difference between them. And I know you've probably heard it before. I certainly think I did this maybe you know many months ago whenever I was in education, but it's just kind of revisiting uh, what these terms mean to us as a business owner. So fixed costs are things that you can't change. You know, no matter what, whenever you're running your experience, you can change these costs. So they're in, independent, as we're saying there, of output um, and remain the same. So those type of things would be your building, your rent, your machinery, insurance, um, all the kind of fixed costs uh, that you can't change, whether you've got 10 people coming or you've got 22 or 32 people coming to your experience. What you can then change, though, is your variable cost. And they do vary with depending on the amount of people that you have coming to your experience. And this will be relative to the labour and capital kind of the, uh, element of this as well. So list of things down there like wages and gas, electricity and cleaning and all sorts of things. Anything that uh, kind of changes depending on the amount of people that you have uh, needs to be taken into consideration. And if we understand that we've got two sides of the costing model, we've got our fixed costs and our variable costs, then we understand what our operating costs are. So we put this in simple terms, because again, go back to, I like to kind of visually see things. It helps you remember and understand things a lot better. If we work from the bottom up, uh, we've worked out what our variable costs are and our fixed costs. So that leads us into our operating costs. Once we know our operating costs, we can then work out what impact that has on our sales. And that little green kind of box down there is where we're always trying to get to is that profit, trying to work out what the profit is. So this is what I would kind of term like a bottom up kind of approach to pricing. So we're working out what our costs are at the bottom and that's influencing what our retail price is going to be. So as we make our profit, uh, another way to do it, which 
can be something that we, we, we kind of fall into is pricing from the bottom down. So you're kind of saying, look, I think such and such market is only going to pay £35 for my experience. And then you try and work out what profit's left for you. So in my eyes, I would rather do it this way. So you're working out what your costs are, then that will indicate what your retail price should be in order for you to make a profit. So just a little example, to, and I suppose a kind of simple example to show you how that this might work. So if we had an experience that was retailing at £40 and we had 12 people on that experience, well, that's going to mean then uh, that our sales for that experience are going to be £480. We also know then that our fixed costs are 120, which is sitting in here, and we know that our variable cost is £10 per person. Now, that £10 per person variable cost could be as simple as providing tea and coffees or a picnic or just something that will change depending on the amount of people that you have. And there's a simple calculation there that I've done with the 12 people at a variable cost of £10 gives me the 120. So I now know what my fixed costs and my variable costs are going to be. That helps me work out what my operating cost is because it's the, the sum of these two. And I know that my sales are going to be £480 because my experience is priced at £40 per person. So taking away then the sales from the operating costs gives me my profit. So I know for me to run that experience, I'm going to make £240 profit. So very simple terms. That's how I see it, working it out. I'm not an accountant, you know, I'm a, a sales and marketing manager, so I need to have some commercial aspect to, to what I do. But for me, in simple terms, this is how I would try to work out uh, what profit I was making on an experience. So going back to just the simple equation and what that is, because I thought that might be uh, easy, easy to kind of work out within your own business. We do talk about this break-even point, and the break-even point for me is really that point that you are starting to make profit. So that's where you're covering all of your costs. Uh, and, you know, perhaps if you're doing a minimal viable product to market, so the first time you've taken it to market, you might just sell it to friends and family or people that you know, and you might be happy just to break even, just to get the experience out there, just to kind of, you know, test the market with it. Um, so this is where break even comes into being important. And again, to try and break this down for you, if we use the previous example, uh, and we know that our price is £40 per person. We know that our variable costs are £10 per person. So we do the calculation, uh, which will give us the £30. So once we have that £30, then we need to divide that into our fixed costs, which was our 120 from previous. And when we divide 120 by 30, our break even in units is four. So what that's telling me is that I need, if I want to run that experience and not make any profit, but break even and cover all of my costs, I need to sell it to at least four people. Um, so hopefully that is kind of demystified that a little bit for you in terms of how to work that out. And if you have any questions about it, we can cover that at the end. So if we're taking that calculation and popping it back into this little model that I've kind of built for you, um, you can see how that four people um, has come about. So again, uh, our experience was at £40 per person, which gives us the 160 for our total uh, value of our sale. We knew our variable costs were 10 for the four people, so that's 40. Our fixed cost was 120. Add those two together to get 160, and 160 minus 160 is zero. So just working the calculation back on its head, you can see how that works. So at that point, you could take that, that uh, particular experience, market test it to four people, and you would cover your costs and break even. So uh, hopefully that's, as I said, made that a little bit simpler for you. So why this is all important, I suppose, again, is going back to reiterating these indirect sales channels and kind of setting your stall out in terms of where you want to go for the future. Because all too often what might happen is you have a really successful uh, experience for the domestic market that you've priced to suit that marketplace. Um, and then you meet an indirect uh, opportunity to sell your product to a tour operator. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to go onto your website they're going to search, they're going to have a look, and they're going to see how much you're selling that experience for. And if you're only selling that experience for £35, they're probably going to want to buy it off you for, let me see, probably 20 maybe less, because they need to make their margin as well. So that's why it's really important once you set out here to make sure that you're always considering that kind of future, that future goal that you're trying to get to. If you are going to be trying to sell to the international market or the indirect sales channels, uh, you need to price accordingly because they will also be attracting the free and independent traveller who will go through them 
in order to access your offer. So really, really important to price appropriately. And the way that we can do this as like kind of a, a hint or a tip is making sure that you have that portfolio of core and premium experiences. So you have your core, core experiences that you can sell locally, domestically, directly, but you also have those really lovely enhanced experience that you can sell to the wider market. Uh, and, and by all means, uh, you know, do think of this because this is a channel that will help you sell to the rest of the world uh, and make your, your business extremely successful in the future. So those sales channels, uh, the considerations around dealing with them, the indirect sales channels is the cost of the, the, the discount or the commission. Uh, the benefit then in terms of reaching the kind of audience that would be elusive otherwise. So they have access to huge databases of people. They will do all the marketing for you um, and they will bring that business to your door at a cost, of course, because they need to get some margin out of it as well. And then just think about what value that brings to your business. You know, is it, is it worthwhile doing? There's absolutely no issue or problem at all if you are happy to sell to the domestic market and that is the market and the niche that you're working in. Uh, you may never have a reason to go to the indirect sales channel. It can be a very successful, viable, sustainable tourism offering um, without having to go down this route. However, if you do have aspirations to go uh, to sell wider, these are the kind of the, the questions that you need to ask yourself. Is it worthwhile? Is it something that you want to get involved in for the future? And again, back to that assessment of your resources, you know, how much time, energy and financial commitment can you can you actually make to attracting uh, the, the relationship and building the relationship with those indirect sales channels. And incidentally, this is actually why, just going back to Louise, the likes of Fermanagh uh, Lakelands Tourism is so crucial in terms of selling your story and doing a lot of the, the kind of the, the legwork for you on this type of arrangement. So in terms of those margins, the profit margins that we've talked about for indirect sales, it will vary depending on who you're dealing with. Um, but just as a, as a summary, I suppose the things that you want to think about whenever you're looking at your retail price is how much do you want to make in terms of margin? Um, and then how much do you want others to take? And you need to be, you just need to be aware that whenever you are dealing with some of the big uh, kind of operators, that it could be up to about 25 to 30% margin that they will want to take out of that as well. So that's why you need to price appropriately to begin with, to make sure that there's margin for you and there's margin for them whenever you're, you're curating your experiences and your experience portfolio. So that's kind of the roundup of the pricing uh, uh, side of things as well. Hopefully, as I say, uh, it's it's a little bit clearer and I haven't rushed through it uh, too fast, but uh, might be an opportunity now maybe to come off uh, mute and I'll stop the share and uh, open up the floor to, to any questions that you might have. Mary, how did you find that? I found that very good. <laughs> Are you going to be? I was, I, was quite, I, I was quite shocked at the indirect uh, percentages there. Um, some of those are quite, you know, that's a lot into your profit margin. If you, yeah. but again, I suppose if you're in it in a big way, um, it would be very beneficial, um, and would bring a lot of trade your way. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, twenty five percent is a quarter of your, you know, some of those would be yeah. quarter of your profits. But again, as I say, maybe over time, that's something that would benefit your business uh, substantially. So. Maybe it's so not such Louise, a bad thing. Louise, what's your view on that? I mean, you're closer to me. Yeah, to I really like the advice, you know, your domestic experience and then your premium level experience. Like a lot of the tour operators we speak to, the word premium or unique or, you know, they like to think that they're getting, obviously they're going to be looking for the discount that you're talking about there. But um, I think in terms of pricing, yes, it's, it's a great idea to think of that in advance because they're, they're the words that catches their attention. Like, you know, if we talk about VIP experiences or premium level, um, that's the things they want to hear about. And, you know, again, they have clients obviously that, well, some more money than others, but you're going to have these um, higher end clients that are looking for those premium experiences and that yeah, they have the money um, there and, and willing to pay for them. So I think it, it's very important to bring all that into account, but there's definitely an appetite for those kind of experiences from the tour operator side of things. Yeah, yeah, and of course, the higher this was the higher retail price you go, the more cash there is for everybody. So, yes, you know, it's just yeah. Isabel, you raised your hand there. Do you want to say something? Uh, hi, hi, Lisa. Uh, Brian here. Hi, um, Brian. I just wanted to. I, I like to think about the 
just whenever you're trying to work out your, your price for before you, you kind of tap or uh, go into your, your target market. But numbers wise, if you have already worked out how much you need to cover your costs, but you can't really take a large group or number of people. Yeah. Any advice for that there? Is it best to price it per person or should you think about maybe a group pricing? Yeah, so I've come across this dilemma before um, and I think the way around it is that you do a group price. So let me think how to explain this to you better now. So say you had an experience and you, uh, you for it to work for you, you had have to have 10 people. So you set your price for that 10 people. So say that was going to be 50 pounds 50 pound per, per head for 10 people. So there's 500 pounds. But you could actually also sell that to four people, but they would have to spend the 500 pounds. And I think, Louise, isn't that really the way it would work in terms of if you were taken to tra travel t trade? Yeah, well, to be honest, we don't get involved in the pricing side of things. Okay. We leave that. We would um, yeah, send them directly to the trade. But yes, I, I think that's... Yeah, that's, that's more or less the, the issue we, we had kind of uh, crossed in the past was um, yeah. if you need, say, a minimum number, say, for example, four people priced uh, £50 a head and you need that to cover your costs, uh, do you price it at £50 a head and then, you know, make sure you get your four people or do you price it at 200 and say, right, that's for up to four people? Yeah, yeah. I think you just need to work with what the minimum is that you're going to make make a profit. You know, I've seen, I know last year I was up on the North Coast and there were some boat tours, you know, and they had a minimum of 12, but there was only four of us. But we didn't, like obviously for four of us, we didn't want to pay for 12. But it was actually then pushed back on us. We went and then found another few families to join us to make mm -hmm. up the 12. You know, so but so I think I think people I think like the visitor the consumer I think they understand that dilemma that you know you can't be taking a boat out or hiring out you know your facilities you know you know for one or two people for the same price as it would be for five you know, um but yeah I know it's it's a difficult one because no, nobody ever wants to lose business either you don't want to turn business away but I think if you could work out that break even. Yeah, and I think, I think it's also a problem when you can't, you don't have much scope to increase your numbers because of the kind of experience you offer. Yeah. You are limited in the numbers, yeah. uh, either for insurance reasons or whatever, you know. Yeah. 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 So that means that you can't say, oh, I'll charge so much, I could make up to, because your up to is only going to be very little more than your minimum, if you see yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. yeah. And I suppose then it's not that you want to ask add more costs onto your business, but it's just how do you then premiumize that offer or sell it without price being the consideration? You know, it's the fact that it's exclusive, it's VIP, you know, it's premium. You're not going to get this anywhere else in the world. Like who can sit on a swing, you know, in the in the lock? <laughs> you know, have that opportunity. So it's all those we added value things that you're doing, you know, that that makes you so uh, unique. That doesn't cost you anything because they can get their selfie on the swing, mm -hmm. you know. But it's not there's no variable cost to that, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, yeah is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Barry, have you got your hand up now? Hi, Lisa. Yes. Um, no, thanks very much for that. Um, I had a few. One question was around indirect sales. Yeah. Um, through the, these these companies online, I I've tried quite a few of them. Um, and you know, because we're in an area that's oh, your Wi Fi's let you down, Barry. Relatively unknown on a lot of these channels. Am I breaking up here? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. yeah. Great. I, I've tried these indirect sales channels and I haven't been very successful at all. Is that I think it's the online ones, the likes of your book and dot coms, and the those the ones that are kind of you don't have the relationship with them. Exactly. Yeah. So we've tried them. The likes of, um, I think Viator's Viator is one of the biggest ones in the world. It's linked yeah. up with um, TripAdvisor, yeah. and uh, we've well, Booking.com. I think is just relatively new to the to the attraction yeah. side of things. Yeah. But I found that there's really low uptake on them. Uh, even though we're bookable through the likes, we were bookable through the likes of Google, TripAdvisor, um, because I think I think it's because we're in a kind of a relatively not unknown area. 
if you're in Dublin or Belfast, yes, there's loads of experiences there. But if you go type in for mana in any of these indirect sales channels, we're non-existent. We don't exist. You know, there's one or two businesses maybe on it. So yeah. I'm wondering if there's any way, Lisa, of a destination, is there any way we can have more of a presence? Is it just about the businesses getting together and saying, look, if, we weren't, if we're not on these channels, then how are we supposed to be known as a, as a place to go and do things? Because they're, they're effectively, they're not there to be booked. Yes, I know you mean whenever they go in to do the search, then there's very little comes up, so people just don't don't bother using them then because there's there's not the there's not the portfolio of experiences that they can see and choose and pick what they want to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, 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 I suppose the other way of looking at it is the experiences that we provide here are so personal, you know. So probably, you know, there's there's a lot to be said for those the the indirect sales channels that are really upselling what you're doing. You know, it's. I think it's hard with the likes of those online ones because people are just reading text and then they have to go and kind of do a bit of research and websites and probably they've interacted with you about, I don't know, is it seven or nine times before they actually make a conversion or something like that. Um, but yeah, look, I'll, I'll take that back to Karen anyway, Barry. As Yeah, and we'll take a look at maybe Barry here from our yeah. side of things to see if there's anything we can do. I'm not sure, but yeah. Maybe yeah. Something that we or could even get to speak to one of the account managers, Louise, maybe from yeah. one of those um, particular companies and ask them the question. You'll put it back on them and say, look, yeah. you know, Barry's been trying, not getting any traction. What do we do? You know, what do we do for the destination to, to bring it to, you know, top of the rankings or make it more attractive? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, even TripAdvisor, there was a bit of money put in behind uh, the marketing end of it in terms of promoting the experience. And I, th I still think we didn't even get one booking through TripAdvisor. <laughs> I, I was yeah. very surprised. You know, it's one of the biggest platforms in the world yet. We weren't getting any bookings through it at all. And my website was um, where, where all my bookings were coming through. So it, it's just a, a bit of an anomaly. And a lot of people are saying, you know, go down these route and let them take 25% of your um, of, of the of the sale. But yet they're not actually doing anything for you. So I would be reluctant unless there was more of a, um, an incentive to go with it, the, the likes of these indirect sales companies, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I would tend to agree that my first point of action would always be direct. You know, keep the keep the margin for yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, albeit a wee bit more work on your side, but no, that's fine. We'll we'll should Louise and I and Mary will take that back to Karen and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, no worries. Anybody else, Amanda? How are you? Are you there? No. Yes, I am here. I am here. I'm sorry, I have no camera. I'm I'm just back from swimming up at the lakes, and I look like something the cat jumped in. <laughs> very, very unhealthy. Um, I was thinking about that. I was thinking next year of using the um, Airbnb experiences. Yeah. Um, just because my my own experience of renting out accommodation through Airbnb and using Airbnb for many years has been that of all of those big uh, platforms, it's the most personalized. Yeah. And the Airbnb experiences are really quite unique. Yeah. So I think, it, I suspect that one maybe would perhaps do better on Airbnb than on something like Booking.com or TripAdvisor. I think there might be a better route to market through Airbnb. Yeah, the, yeah, the, more uh, the second thing I would say is, yeah, with the other, the, the non-offline, the, 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 the ones that are, are sort of more boutique um, uh, travel agents markets. Yeah, I, I, we've talked, so I've been on a, a TNI um, course just recently for historic houses. And that we had a lot of discussion about that. Um, and I think everybody's interested in doing that. But I, the conclusion that we came to was that those have got to be experiences that you literally cannot put on your website because those companies are not going to buy things from you that yeah. other people can book. So in order to preserve the uniqueness, yeah. they've in a way got to be hidden. So it's quite a fine line to negotiate what you make visible and what you yeah. keep hidden for very, very... Um, premium markets I'm sort of struggling with how to do that really and, and trying to figure yeah. it all out yeah yeah no absolutely or I mean it, it's, it's a challenge for everybody and, and yeah you're spot on they, they want the exclusive they want mm -hmm. to be the only person that can offer what you have what you've offered them yeah exactly you, you go and sell it to anybody else yeah um 
uh, that kind of exclusivity. So I suppose you have to weigh that up between, you know, the size of the prize, you know, yeah, is exactly. the exclusivity exactly. then worth it? Yeah. Or are you going to get a broader, you know, kind of uh, customer base and a better price? Yeah, from, exactly. from selling it yourself. It's just yeah. the size of the prize, really, isn't it? And the third thing that came up, which we came to at the end of that course, was um, for the historic houses, um, trying to think within TNI of having a special, uh, our, our own uh, tab and our own hashtag on um, on the main TNI site. And of course, that's another potential, I think, for Omen for Mana, uh, that since we are still a little bit out there compared to some of the other tourist areas that we potentially could think about a collective marketing. Um, I know we're. I know there's lots of that already being done. But yeah, some for, for the experiences, for example, some type of collective marketing uh, tab or hashtag that would work for us. I don't know. That's something that that, that that's that's where we got to on that course. That was the hard, That was a very difficult thing to. We felt that we needed a lot more um, the proposition. conversation about that. Yeah. Proposition of what you're offering needed to be better. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So that was, sorry I arrived late. I was no, really, no, I good, good to hear from you anyway. Good to hear from you. Yeah, it's nice to, I, I was desperate to join so that I would see what you actually look like. <laughs> <laughs> I promise next time, next time I'll turn my camera on, but really today would be too embarrassing as I've <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, Amy, have you any feedback just for, I know we're going to talk later on, but. No, I think all good. Um, a lot of good information and a lot of good things to think about. So yeah, no, all good. Good. And uh, Katrina, how about you? Yeah, no, all was good. It's sort of especially the part around the, the pricing, you know, just trying to work out because that's sort of the part that you kind of struggle struggle with because you sort of sometimes think have you overpriced it or underpriced it so it's just the way you break down that was just showing good to how to get your the balance right yeah look and as i say it's not an accountant's approach to it it's just a, a sales sales and marketing approach to it you know in terms yeah. of trying to see uh, uh how you would do that obviously it can be extremely sophisticated but for me it helps me understand right okay what's the minimum here that that we can do this for that everybody's it's worthwhile yeah mm -hmm. okay all right, everybody. So we're just past uh, 11 o'clock. Mary, do you want to add anything else in? Just uh, Not quite. It was very, very informative. Thank you very much indeed. Lisa, it was very good. Um, yes, plenty plenty of food for thought there, I think, for everyone. So it takes, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to digest it all again, go back over it again, which is great when it's recorded. So yeah. um, people can go back over it again and uh, hopefully that'll help them as well and those that have missed it as well. So Thank yeah. you very much, Lisa. That's brilliant. Thank you. No worries. And Louise, thanks for joining me today as well. Much oh, thank you. Get down to meet you face to face one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody.